So if Tomash is on, um, I suggest we put that first. But otherwise, maybe you could just review it. Okay. Um, I can do a couple uh, logistics things first, uh, just the HackFest planning and internship program update, and then we'll have uh, uh, the borough proposal Q&A on GSL, as well as the uh, project uh, tiering discussion. Um, so really quickly on the uh, HackFest side of things, April 24th and 25th, uh, DC area, I'm dropping the link into the chat window right now. If you are attending, please get registered as soon as possible. Uh, also, we have a draft agenda started. Uh, thank you to those that have been populating some suggested topics in there. Uh, anything else, please get it slotted in. Uh, we'll get those uh, all sorted out at the beginning of day one there. Uh, on the internship program front, um, only update is we're working to finalize who the six interns will be. We're working to close on that by the end of next week and get everything kicked off. Uh, so we're in touch with all the mentors there, and they're uh, reviewing the proposals right now. Any questions? Just a on... question. Yes. On, on this, I mean, I mean, how is it going? Do you do? Did we get many candidates? Yeah, uh, really well. There was fantastic response. There were around forty people, uh, forty students that applied for the program. So we're really happy with that uh, to fill six slots. So uh, really good, diverse set of candidates uh, across geographies and uh, interests as well. That's great. Thanks. Yep. All right. Uh, so, Chris, next up, um, we have the borough proposal slotted. I don't know if you want to do that or move to the GSL, just since we're not at quorum quite yet. Yeah, I wanted uh, to give Tomash the opportunity because we deferred him for like a month, I think. And yep, uh, we keep running the, the clock. And so I think the right thing to do is to give Tomash um, you know, maybe a, a couple of minutes to sort of refresh everyone's memory on the GSL uh, discussion. And I think that, you know, at the end of his last presentation, that there were still some remaining questions. So I think this is the opportunity then to um, to discuss those. So, Tomas, do you want to sort of recap the, the the, you know, the prior discussion and then we can open it up for questions? Yes, uh, thank you. Um... So thank you for this opportunity. Um, I I think that you already uh, um, probably this uh, presentation first of first a white paper about the GSL where we introduced the concept and then our presentation on um, the GSL of how we think that this uh, would um, fit into an enterprise environment, um, especially in financial services, and how this would be a very generic utility um, that we think uh, is uh, probably of interest uh, also besides for our uh, industry. Um, there, uh, while, uh, while I did this presentation, I received uh, quite a few questions and uh, the, uh, through the chat, but since we were at the end of the session, I could not answer them and uh, therefore choose to uh, collect those questions and give their, the answers to them in writing. Um, uh, the, maybe I just resend that document again to the, to the developer list, so, uh, to the TSC list, so people do not have to uh, search for it. Just a moment. So the first question was uh, where I can find the, the previous paper instead of me recapping. I think it's best if you just refer to that. Uh, you find you find the link on our website, and this is also linked in the question, the Q and Q and A I just made. 
the next question was, uh, is the GSL intended to replace parts of existing projects or a complementary project, or is, is this a complementary project? Um, we think that uh, really the GSL is a concept uh, that is uh, that decouples a, a, um, a certain functionality out of uh, existing platforms and uh, it help, it is it is part of an architecture so the design of the the, the gsl uh, can be can be hierarchical uh, it is uh, it it basically creates an interoperability in the sense of how we structure a platform and also it is a tool of interoperability potentially as an, eventually between uh, um, distributed ledgers or even generic uh, traditional ledgers. The next question was, does the GSA replace uh, the ordering service of Fabric or is it parallel uh, um, or is it a parallel commitment log? Uh, well, the, the concept of the GSA doesn't really cap cover the, the algorithms that, that are used to sequence uh, transactions. Um, actually, it could, uh, it could use hyperledger fabrics. It could also use, uh, as in the next, next question somebody asked, it could also uh, be used to implement a Cordas notary service. Um, the next question was, is there more information on the cryptographic nature of the notification that we implemented? Um, if you remember, the, the, the GSL had uh, the, um, the function of uh, not only evidencing uh, um, contracts, but also uh, notifying uh, parties uh, about the fact okay. that they are involved in that. Yeah, yeah. And uh, that, that notification, um. it, that notification is uh, done using uh, um, a cryptographic primitives that ensure that is the notification is only understood by those who are concerned and uh, for everybody else it looks like uh, um, um, random data and this notification um, mechanism is what the question was is based on uh, our computation out of a shared secret between um, the sender of the notification and the recipient of the notification this is a, a well-known uh, algorithm to derive a shared secret in, uh, in an elliptic curve cryptography. And uh, we just use that to obtain an, uh, um, an to create an offline protocol, so a protocol that doesn't need a co uh, an, or an online cooperation of sender or receiver, but just the fact that the, the sender knows the public key of the recipient, uh, he can um, create a, um, a shared secret and then use the shared secret to derive uh, a sequence of notification tokens that are then uh, distributed in the ledger. Um, the next question was... Uh, Mark, could, yes? Yeah, I was just wondering if you could remind uh, those of us that, that read your paper probably a couple months ago, uh, which notification that is that you're referring to? Uh, we um, defined the a a function of the GSL, uh, the capability to notify parties involved in a transaction. Since we said that the GSL is evidencing, uh, um, evidencing contracts or transactions, um, uh, which are uh, not interpreted by the GSL, but are interpreted by a higher level layer, uh, this means that uh, those who are uh, connected to uh, those those participants who are connected to the GSL uh, could then uh, basically need an additional uh, means of being notified that there is a contract that is that that, that they are concerned that that they are involved in. So they are uh, because the, the the evidence itself doesn't carry any information on the GSL level of the contract. And that uh, notification mechanism is uh, uh, that I refer to, and that is that we implement using that shared secret. Thank you. So the next question was, will the distributed ledger reference model uh, that we promised uh, release to the architecture or white paper working group? Certainly, certainly, that's, that's our goal. 
that we create this first draft and circulate and uh, collect input from uh, from major framework internals, <laughs> also projects from uh, external to Hyperledger before releasing it to wider community input. It is, um, we hope that this uh, reference model uh, can be validated by uh, mapping it to existing frameworks. And if we, if we manage that, that could be a great confirmation. And that's, that's, that's why this prior step, prior step of validation on existing frameworks. But yes, uh, we will definitely release this. Um, the next question was whether we are proposing to uh, if we are proposing to create a, a project with it, or whether it will be incubated inside the hyperledger. Well, we we um, we don't know yet. Uh, if uh, we don't do that yet, to, to be precise, at this time um, um, we are uh, we are discussing this idea with vendors, clients, and and figure out if there is really an interest for such an independent project. And and the the, the community reception of this reference model uh, will definitely. Uh, influence that decision whether it makes sense to start such a project within Hyperledger. I think uh, these were the questions I received and if you have any additional, um, please go on. I take this as no and then we can proceed in that agenda. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks, Tomas. Thank you. Um, so next up is Burrow. Are we Quarry? Uh, yeah, we're at Quorum now. Uh, and then, All right, uh, thanks, Todd. Silas or Benjamin, so, uh, does one of you want to share your screen? I can give you presenter rights. Yeah, if um, hey, yeah this is Benjamin. Um, yes, please, that, that would be perfect. Okay, one second. All right. Let me know if this works. Um, if I go full screen. Yep. Looks good. All right. Well, first of all, um, thank you very much, Hyperledger Community, the TSC. Um, we recently joined Hyperledger as, as a general member um, and, and we're very uh, enthusiastic to, to propose the code base that we have, um, which we've dubbed Hyperledger Borrow um, as a project proposal now to the Hyperledger Steering Committee. Um, so a quick overview of, of what I'll briefly discuss. I don't want to take too much of your time, so, so I'll briefly talk across uh, what is Burrow, uh, which was formerly called RSDB. And I'll give a bit of motivation and history of Monax, why we built it, and also why we're uh, making this proposal. I'll give a high level overview on the solution of what is the actual code base. Um, and I'll go from there uh, into how do we think that this can be valuable to the Hyperledger uh, community and the other Hyperledger projects. Um, and then I'll try to leave time for questions. So I'll try to not go in too much depth, but if you have questions, then also please feel free to ask them while or afterwards um, during the presentation. So what is Burrow? Uh, it was formerly called uh, RSDB, part of the ERIS platform. Um, we think of Burrow as the permission smart contract machine. It is a full distributed ledger. Um, We've worked over the years to, to make it modular. And importantly, it has a permission smart contract interpreter on top of it. This interpreter is built to the Ethereum virtual machine. Sorry, um, there was an echo. Um, it's built to the specification of the Ethereum virtual machine. Um, I don't know where I'm getting an echo from, but. It's Sorry. muted now. Sorry about that. Right. Yeah, also a colleague opened the laptop, so I was thinking it was internal on our side. Sorry. And so it's carrying, uh, picking back up the thread. So, so importantly, it has a smart contract interpreter um, that we've always built from the start uh, in accordance to the Ethereum virtual machine specification. So that allows us to 
leverage as much of the tooling from the uh, active Ethereum community, in, in specifically the, the compilers and Solidity coding language. So code that is compiled with Solidity will also run on, on our Ethereum virtual machine. And then for the consensus engine, we've worked closely with uh, Tenement Consensus, which provides us transaction finality and, and fully cryptographically signed DFT consensus. So very recently, um, in part in preparation for this proposal, we've moved as of version 016, the code base from GPL3 to Apache 2.0. Um, and, and that's a new step in its existence. So it has been remodeled and, re, uh, and updated and, and improved over many years now, um, since 2014. Um, so this is a new chapter for, for this code base. But why have we built it, um, this permission smart contract machine? For us, the reason has always been on business value optimization across the, the full chain. Um, for this, we felt that it's important that you have a very strong deterministic smart contract execution um, so that there's always a fully verifiable trace of, of all um, the transactions that have happened. Um, as a legal engineering company, we put permissions first to observe both legal uh, and, and commercial constraints. And so I'll, I, I'm highlighting those two points because I think that they will correspond to technical parts of the borough code base that we think are potentially viable or, or valuable to the larger Hyperledger project. Um, as a case in point, uh, there is an older blog post where we wrote smart contract networks, which just so happen to currently reside on blockchains are an immensely useful tool, um, which really hopefully brings down the point that, that we're interested in the higher level uh, application logic for, for this wider range of technologies that is fastly evolving. Um, and so, so as a company, we build several things. So we build industry specific, legally engineered smart contract as the case. We also provide blockchain as a service where, where we help enterprises um, set up their POCs or, or production systems. Um, but on the open source side, we build the Monax platform. So a large part of that is development tooling. And it's important to make it clear that this is not what we're proposing. Um, those libraries are GLP-3 licensed, um, but the full distributed ledger with the permissioned Ethereum virtual machine um, is now Apache licensed, and this is part of the proposal to the Hyperledger uh, Technical Steering Committee. So trying to move a bit on, um, at a very high level, Burrow can be seen um, as a stack of four major components. At the very top, the highest level of abstraction is this permissioned Ethereum virtual machine that is both stateless and it consumes an application state interface. Um, what we feed it into is a specific smart contract application engine, which um, adds a new feature to, to the Ethereum virtual machine. Namely, we have secure native functions from which we can derive a permission layer. The ability that this gives us is that we have a sort of a super user uh, ability that, that uh, restrains what smart contracts can do inside the application. So you can draw some analogy to, to an operating system where not all um, actions are permitted. Uh, those layers themselves are abstracted out by uh, the application blockchain interface. And then as I mentioned, Tenement um, is the consensus engine we run on. And so that is um, a dependency of Burrow. But the interesting point to us um, is how would we look to build new value being part of the Hyperledger project? And so on the left side, I put forward some points that I think are interesting to consider. Um, so at the highest level, the permissioned EVM is a stateless uh, piece of code that will transition state, and so that can quite nicely be thought of as well as a transaction processor in Sawtooth or as chain code um, in Fabric. 
then I've highlighted that we are interested in, in this permissioning layer from legal compliance and legal engineering. So that there is an interest for us to, to harmonize the permissioning layer across different distributed ledgers. Um, and hopefully we can bring some expertise to this field as well. Uh, and then finally, all the way down on the consensus engine, we are not tied to any consensus engine. So we've built this application blockchain interface to as much as possible abstract those two components out. Um, and it would be interesting to look at supporting proof of elapsed time there as well. Um, so bringing down this point, we've always aimed uh, at building or enabling ecosystem applications. And for that purpose, we've built tools and we've never tried to, to set standards. So we've um, allowed Tendermint to become its own standard or we've worked with the Ethereum virtual, uh, with the Ethereum community to, to, to not introduce or compete on those standards. And in the same sense, it is interesting for us now to, to look with other Hyperledger projects and, and work groups um, to really see whether we can have the permission DVM run as an application engine on, on different distributed ledger technologies like I mentioned, harmonizing this permissioning layer that we think is crucial for enterprise purposes. Um, there are obviously also questions, but this might be ahead of time where we are, like can we standardize or, or come together on network genesis and runtime configuration? Um, and then there is some very interesting work also with Sawtooth Lake, the transaction families that they have there. So can we harmonize on standardize on transaction format? Um, or even RPC standardization where that why might be um, applicable. Um, so a final note, just um, thanking especially also Dan Middleton from Intel for, and the whole SOTU team for, for uh, interesting discussions so far and also for advising on in these early steps inside the Hyperledger community. Um, thanking Casey, my apologies, I should have um, Apologize for Casey, he wanted to be here, but he um, is on a flight to the US, so he couldn't make it. Um, and then finally, well, obviously my team uh, and Silas in specific, but finally also um, Andreas Freund from Tata Consulting. They have built on our platform um, and built their own platform in a larger extent. And, and over the past half years, we've had interesting technical discussions and internal proposals on how to uh, build significant new features, and so they have expressed interest. By the way, ben, that was awesome. I also talked to Casey. I don't know, are you guys going to be at the Hackfest in DC on the 24th, 25th? This is Jonathan speaking. Have I lost audio? Um, no, I don't know. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, but who am I talking to? Uh, it's Jonathan Levy. Uh, I don't know if you guys are going to be at the Hackfest in uh, like next month in DC, but I put uh, I put some an item there that we can start playing with more collaboration, like cross project kind of collaboration. Try to do some hyperledger with different consensus in kind of fabric or hyperledger with poet, you know, like some, some something that combines a few projects. So I don't know, that's gonna be nice to play with it. I lost like, the connection. Oh, we must have lost the connection with uh with Hi there, yeah, I think this is Silas speaking. I think we've had a bit of a problem. I've just reloaded and um I, I think I we're back on. Sorry, could whoever was speaking last uh, just to repeat the last couple of sentences for us? Yes, yes, sure. Sorry. I didn't know if you guys are going to come. I talked to Casey before, Ben, and I was trying to see if, if you like, it's going to be interesting to try to play with some cross-project integration, like you suggested, to try to play with Sawtooth, to try to look at Poet, to try to kind of combine kind of a wor workflow that going through Fabric, you know, uh, tandem, I don't know, to try to combine some of this stuff. We can play with these ideas, but yeah. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I think we'd, we'd like, like to do that. that. What what are you referring to? And the one in DC. I'll, I'll I'll post a link on the chat. There's okay. something <clears> told. This is uh, April twenty fourth and twenty fifth. Yeah. Thanks. Sorry for the connection. I also don't know what happened, but I should be back online. Um, 
twice now, I think, that one sharing the screen, one the audio. Um, so I, I hope nothing fell out of the, the um, short presentation, but if you have any questions, um, or if I should pick it up back from where I got caught out, then please uh, let me know. Uh, Benjamin, um, our hi community, this is William. I have a quick question. Hello. Yes, of course. Um, Benjamin, is there any work uh, being done uh, with the rootstock um, in that in that relationship there? Um, no, no, we we do not uh, explicitly collaborate with rootstock. Um, I I am aware that they moved to the Ethereum virtual machine as well. Is that correct? But um, uh, no, we, no, there's no collaboration. Okay, just just asking, just uh, interested because I'm 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 in touch with some some people the rootstock and uh, it, it's interesting to know that if they, they are moving to the Ethereum uh, virtual machine versus and at the same time parallel uh, waiting for a SegWit and all the other progress that's being done in Bitcoin. Yeah, um, definitely, and and I think this is in some sense um, significant in the sense that there are not that many Ethereum virtual machine implementations out there. Um, and for better or worse, I think this is the first one licensed Apache 2.0. So, so it will um, enable easier collaboration on uh, the Ethereum virtual machine. And at least that is also our hope for, for the relicensing that we've done. Great. All right. Thanks, for Ben. You're welcome. Hi, right, this is uh, Vipin. Uh, since you brought up the uh, Ethereum virtual machine, uh, what is going to be... Um, the relationship between you and the uh, Ethereum Enterprise Alliance, and how does it uh, jive with your um, uh, incubation in uh, Hyperledger? Um, so that's a very interesting question, uh, and and we have a deliberate um, intention here, namely that one, we are a member of the Ethereum um, Enterprise Ethereum Alliance. Um, as we are also a member of the Hyperledger community now. And our interpretation is that the Enterprise Ethereum Alliance is predominantly, um, right now at least, playing the role for a standardization body for Ethereum. Um, so with that, I think we can bridge the two communities and at least um, especially for Hyperledger itself, allow for a gateway into the Enterprise Ethereum uh, Alliance, which currently is debating what the new standard should be. Um, but at the same time, there exists um, uh, an Ethereum implementation that is part of both now. Well, not now yet, so. And just to add to that, um, one of our aims is to encourage, encourage, um, um, to to encourage our funding, funding of the Ethereum standard. So uh, standardizing around the uh, EVM on its own would be of interest to us. Um, did we lose the connection? No. No, no, we can hear you. We hear you. Another uh, question for you um, from Bipin. Um, could you go into uh, some detail about the whole permissioning thing? Because uh, you had suggested that that could become a, a, a layer or an idea that would uh, bind all of the um, different um, DLTs in under the Hyperledger umbrella. Uh, yeah, definitely. And so, so a lot of the um... Uh, well, all of the current uh, DLTs, if I'm not mistaken, are already permissioned DLTs. Um, what we've done specifically with the Ethereum virtual machine and why it's referred to on the slides and in the proposal as a permissioned Ethereum virtual machine is that contrary to the public Ethereum uh, virtual machine ex implementations that exist, we at every execution step check for the permissions of the account um, before executing any steps. So, so we will return additional errors if permissions are not observed. 
Um, we've done this explicitly in the execution of the EVM, um, but the general concept is that it is important to have um, certain operations that can be restricted um, only uh, by, by, by managerial accounts um, or allowed by managerial accounts. Um, we, so, and so the general concept that we have there is uh, our secure native functions, which are um, implemented natively in the blockchain, um, but can be exposed to the smart contract layer, um, essentially through, through a pointer contract. Um, but they, they are very different from the public Ethereum where all, where the permissionless um, is provided for by the availability of, of cryptocurrency to spend. Uh, and so we don't have cryptocurrency um, inside the logic of our borough blockchain client. Rather, we use the permissions to restrict certain actions on the network and, and others. Um, what shape that permissioning layer eventually takes across multiple um, blockchain clients is to me unknown. But I think it is very important or, or very useful, at least from our perspective, um, to, to, to have some standardization or some reflection on, on what that would mean uh, if you want to connect different types of technologies together. For example, it's maybe interesting for these permissions to, to be able to carry over as well. So if you're, uh, if you're checking with every, uh, not every action, but some significant actions, does it, um, slow down? I mean, have you observed the, that there's a degradation in performance or is it, um, I mean, what kind of... Um, so so the, these, these checks are natively implemented um, and, and there's no significant overhead on, on checking these permissions. Um, the, the permissions state is also just stored in the account state. So for all loaded accounts, it's, it's equivalent to read from the contract storage or to read its permissions. So there's no significant um, overhead there. So I, I tend to think of permissioning in, in two different kind of orthogonal mm -hmm. ways. One is what nodes on the network are allowed to publish blocks. And I think that's maybe a very common way of thinking of permissioning, who's, who's admitted to the network. Uh, in a sense, being able to, to publish updates to the network. And then there's the, the kind of permissioning of what kind of transaction from a, a client perspective is allowed and what are the rules on that kind of transaction. Uh, so yeah. does the, the permissioning layer that, that you're providing here affect that, that first kind of, of who's allowed to publish blocks on the network? goes uh, in, in borrowed two ways. So it extends um, upwards into the application of what a transaction can execute, but it is also um, implemented downwards into the consensus engine. And specifically for Tendermint, we only have known, known validators um, that sign off cryptographically. Um, and for them to bond a stake before they can start uh, exercising that voting power that they've bonded, they need to have the permission to bond that stake. Um, so that is an additional restriction on who can commence validating blocks as well. Thanks. And then you would, you would also be able to control that then with the, with the transaction. So it, in, yes. in the Sawtooth system, we do that with uh, a kind of admission transaction for what uh, make it originally advertised as the uh, endpoint registry and we now call it a validator registry but it's essentially a table in that shared database it says who a valid uh who a valid validator is <laughs> so it's that same kind of concept uh, yeah, yeah, then that you're able to we, have a transaction have the, that admits a yeah so so we sorry, both have the explicit transactions to bond which um are only valid if you have the permission to bond and that then will allow you to start validating who are the validators is stored in a specific section of the Patricia tree. Um, so that, that there's also a Merkle proof of who is validating at what point in, um, in the chain. So in other words, embedded in the uh, blockchain itself. Uh, so, yes. uh, so yeah. there is a seamless view here. It's not an orthogonal uh, view. In other words, 
both the validators and the transactors are uh, sort of addressed in similar manner. Is that correct or is, is it my misunderstanding? That is correct, um, with the exception that we have a, a separate um, Patricia state of the root tree of the Merkle tree that, that registers also additionally who are the validators. Um, and so that information is twice in, in, the, uh, in the full tree in the sense that they are also present as accounts in the system. That might not have been your answer. Sorry. Oh, sorry. If it was on, so, can I change gears for just a second? Um, well, so th before you go, Nick, um, so I, I want to make sure that we're not just sort of going, you know, deep into, you know, what I would call a mink hole. Mink hole is a rat hole that just, it's a nicer place to be. Um, and um, that was bad. So, well, this is. <laughs> so I think, I mean, this is all really interesting conversation and discussion and, you know, getting into the technical weeds, but I don't know that that's really what we're here to review. I think what we're really here to review is the, the nature of the proposal, you know, are there going to be enough people around to, to work on this? Is there interest in collaborating across all of those things that have been sort of outlined here? And I'm wondering if we should, you know, I mean, we can take some of this stuff offline and have conversations in chat or on email um, as we want to go deeper into the specifics of how it's implemented. But um, I think that, you know, we should try and keep the, the conversation up level where we're really focusing on uh, on the proposal itself and not on the technology. Does that make sense? Yeah, in fact, the question that I was going to ask was, was, you know, um, can you tell me a little bit about the community um, that's using this? How mature is the technology? Um, Perfect. So, where where do you stand on on use and maturity, and um, how broad is your kind of contributor base right now? Um, so the user base um, as an open source project starts, of course, uh, are predominantly, I think, startups. Um, in, in the sense that it's a free open source permission platform for them to work with. Um, but that obviously from the commercial side is extended um, by both the, the public partnerships that we have, um, which are Deloitte, PwC, EY, and with those and Accenture, uh, uh, Cognizant, sorry, I'm getting business feedback here. Um, and, and the, the, the partners that we've built projects with, um, which are both uh, commercial banks um, and other insurance companies. Yeah, I'm getting a feed here. And some logistics companies. So sorry for the fake answer, um, but I'm getting at this life. Um, uh, but then, so, so, so that is our focus group, right? We were obviously um, in this game for the commercial uh, market, um, but we feel that this is technology that needs to be built in an open source, uh, non, uh, not owned by, by one company. And so we've never aimed to, to own this technology, but we've always seen it as a need that it needed to exist. And so the uh, the whole blockchain technology itself is maturing. Um, and this is also why I think that, that we're very um, enthusiastic about the maturity and the fast growth of the Hyperledger community is because we do not want to be the main maintainer of this code base. And so far, that has been the case. We, Like I mentioned, uh, we are very grateful for Andreas um, and, and his group at Tata Consulting who have provided um, technical discussions on, on a regular basis. Um, but so far the code maintenance has been predominantly on, on our basis. Um, and that is obviously something that, that we would want to see change. So as I understand uh, it, the code you. is, the code base is, is something in the order of three, three years old. Is that what 
what I saw in the in the proposal that you've been working yeah, on this so, for about so it two has, years. Yeah, end of and, 2014 is when when it started. And there are multiple pilot deployments that you have um, based on it. Yeah, 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 we we have multiple deployments. Um, as of 2015, I think it was mid 2015 we started deploying this. Yes. And, and it's far from perfect and it has grown um, a lot, but uh, there are components that we are think, think provide a, a specific value, um, which I've highlighted is the Ethereum virtual machine. Um, other components have, we have spin off, spin off in, in Tendermint, for example, um, but the whole distributed ledger as a whole is our current workhorse. Um, but it is not our intention to to be sitting on this code base or to keep it in the current form that it has. So so that's why um, we've also emphasized the, the the possibilities of interacting with other hyperledger projects here. And one of the things, things that, that drove particularly early adoption was the quality of the tooling and the, the fact that um, spinning up uh, different types of distributed services and running chains was it's not perfect with our tooling, but it's a lot easier than it than it certainly was um, early on. Uh, so there's maturity around our user base with quite a lot of deployments, um, but we'd like to see a lot more significant, uh, meaningful contribution to the core code, which is which is why we're interested in joining. Uh, thank you, Jonathan, for uh, supporting us there. Uh, in the chat, is um, is Tendermint collaborating with you as well? So, so we definitely, on a developer level, work very closely with Tendermint. Um, their code base is also Apache 2.0 and already was. Um, so we have that as a dependency. But it is not where we think the real value and the distributed. Uh, space really lies um, in the sense that the value comes from the application that runs on it. Um, it is a requirement, of course, which is why we've helped build it, but it is not where you produce the actual value. Um, and so Tendermint is its own legal entity, um, but as, as developers, we're on frequent contact. Um, and just one more thing that the, um, on the details, just um, I know you did the license conversion. Um, are you comfortable with the Apache 2 license and, and the legitimacy of the conversion and the licenses on it? Do you mean uh, whether we, we, we've... Did you get all of the developers? All our, yeah, yeah. So, so both yeah. for um, investors and for, uh, uh, for our... Uh, Venture capital investors, we've had these documents already, um, so the work was quite light, but we've, we've made sure that everything um, is indeed compatible with the Apache 2 uh, license that we now have, and, and the full dependency list has been searched. Yes. And also, okay. all contributors, all lines of code um, are checked off. Um, and for two contributors that contributed as non-employees um, while uh, it was still GPL P3. We have explicit um, signed, um, uh, I don't know what the legal term is, but things that say that they're okay with that. Brian, are you, have you looked at, are you comfortable with the licensing at this point? I have uh, not, not scrutinized the code. I mean, that's something we can do during the incubation process early on. Right. Um, okay. We have a license scanning uh, tools as well um, that we could, we could bring to bear earlier uh, if we wanted to. Um, uh, so uh, uh, no, we, we, we do even a more thorough check, but uh, I'm comfortable that uh, Monax has taken the due diligence uh, required for this. I brought it up early and they reassured, and we've all been through the, uh, the C++ relicensing attempt as well. So I think I think they are appropriately focused on it. What I haven't also checked is dependencies. It does sound like Tendermint is a Patsy license, which is great. I didn't know if there are any others in there, but that's something else we can check. Okay. So was, um, in looking at the I, proposal, that was my biggest concern. So. Yeah. So yeah, and it 
it, since uh, it was uh, probably a common concern, I did take a look. I didn't individually look at every single file, but I did kind of spot check around. So uh, right. I at least looked at so it somewhere. I think, uh, yeah, and I think that that's something that we, you know, we probably should do. And I don't know if we want to defer any kind of a vote or we want to vote and just make it um, you know, predicated on a license scan and so forth. I think, um, you know, again, my, my concern was sort of what uh, Mick had originally outlined in terms of community. And I'm only on my phone, and so I can't, I, I, I'm unable to sort of get a look. How, how many community contributors do you have roughly? I see there's about a thousand commits uh, in the ARIS TB repo. Um, but I, I I couldn't derive on the phone how many individuals that comprises. Do you know? Well, so looking looking directly at GitHub, it's eleven. Um, I'd say 11. that's a uh, uh, yeah, that's that's a pretty uh, shallow tail though. So I mean, we've we've had a few pretty useful bug fixes and contributions, but we've had, for yeah. example, no major architectural feature uh, additions from people who haven't at some point been working with uh, Eris. Monax. Okay. So this is Arno speaking. Uh, in keeping with the questioning on, uh, you know, how much collaboration can we really expect here? And, you know, don't take this as adversarial by any means. I mean, I think, you know, this has been raised by several people on the TSC calls lately is, you know, we keep getting these projects and we always imagine the kind of cross-pollination or integration we could work on and then the reality is it's not always easy to get it done and so my question is you know so you listed in your presentation uh, several possible uh, integration points which you know sounds very interesting but so are you personally actually interested in this in other words would Monax take advantage of having you know, EVM on Sawtooth or, or, or Poet on, you know, integrated with any of this. I mean, what's your level of motivation? Do you actually have a stake in having these integrations happen? Or is it just, yeah, it would be interesting to do? Mm, I, I can share a few points, I think, but I will uh, maybe leave one to um, Dan. Um, Specifically, we are legitimately interested. Um, one argument that I can present for that is that we are a small startup that still has to watch its resources that it's been. And so far, we, we have always built the, the open source platform as a cost sink. Um, it has been there as a necessity to enable our actual product. Um, and so, so we have a very strong incentive to um, uh, use more mature, more funded, stronger platforms where they are possible. Um, the points where we look to collaborate is where we think that it enables us to continue pushing our product, which is legally engineered smart contracts. Um, and we are more agnostic to, to the actual distributed ledger that it runs on. Um, so we definitely have that as a strong motivation. Um, with permission from Dan, uh, one of the reasons that he is on the co-sponsor, I mentioned as a co-sponsor is because we've had um, very interesting early discussions already um, on how we could, with minimal effort, look to, for example, run the permissioned EVM as a transaction um, processor on top of Sawtooth permissioned ledger. <coughs> um, so I, I, as much as I can prove this by just speaking, yes, we are definitely motivated to to take these points seriously. They're not lightheartedly put on, on the presentation. All right, thank you. And yeah, I can, I can uh, support what uh, Benjamin was saying there that uh, when, uh, I think it was Brian probably first uh, suggested the possibility of, of Monax contributing Burrow, I guess before it was even quite called Burrow a couple of weeks ago, uh, reached out and started looking where it would make sense to, you know, where would this plug in into the Hyperledger family? And it seemed like there was a, a good potential coupling on uh, the APIs that we've created recently for 
transaction processing logic, which could include in this case an EVM. Hey, hey uh, this is Murali from DDCC. Um, so, so just sort of clarify or get an understanding, right? So some of the projects that initially came into Hyperledger, I thought at the incubation phase, um, you could have certain level of contribution from external participants, but it is at that incubation stage where you gain attention from other contributors. And once you gain a lot of contributors from external entities, that's what matures you to the next level. So isn't that the case that uh, you know we should allow these ideas to you know seed or you know have some incubation time for other teams or other uh, contributors to pick it up? This, this is Brian. It is it is true that the incubation period of time is a time for us to um, draw other developers in and and build that case that it is a viable freestanding you know community. So so our threshold at this point should be: is there a likelihood of developing that? Is it being bootstrapped with the right attitude um, and enough of a critical mass to at least get to a second stage? Um, but I, I I feel pretty confident that as this comes in. Um, uh, it will bring other developers from the Ethereum community to it, uh, and and we can be opportunistic about the collaboration between it and, and other projects. Um, and I've heard the right messaging from the developers at Monax and the right intent. So um, I think that's a large part of what we might want to base our our decision on. Today. Right. And I, Brian, I've actually heard the same from Andrew and from Joe. So. Um, you know, I suspect that if this, um, uh, you know, if we approve it, that there it's likely that you know they may contribute some of that as well. Do we still have quorum? Uh, uh, away from the end, so just wondering if we wanted to try to take a vote. It, it looks like yeah, true. That's probably good before we start losing people. Yep. Todd, we have everybody. Yep. All right. So running through the list, uh, Arno. Yes. Chris. Uh, yes. Dan. Yes. Hart. Yes. Mick. Yes. Morali. Yes. Richard. Uh, yes. Tomash. Yes. All right, uh, that's unanimous. Uh, that's approved. All right, uh, congratulations, guys, and thanks for. Thanks for <laughs> Thank uh, you very much. Uh, yeah, we have, uh, I have a little celebration here. Uh, mission control. <laughs> Thank so you very much. Uh, uh, the only other topic was around the. Uh, project tiering structure top level versus sub projects i know we don't have time to dive too far into that but if you guys just wanted to do a quick uh update or rehash so, there, brian or chris yeah so there's there's been a lot of discussion on the mailing list the the last set of notes that i saw from arno and dan and hart and a couple of others i think were largely plus ones uh brian i think you're Kind of the odd man out at this point because I haven't heard. Well, I have, I mean, and again, I apologize for this morning. I haven't seen it if there's anything on the list, but I think you were not necessarily in the boat. And but I haven't seen a response um, recently. I, so I'd like, to, I'd like to continue the conversation on list. Um, I didn't. Yeah, that, that's what I thought. That's what I thought. Only one. I didn't get the same sense. I was the only one kind of expressing the desire for the flat hierarchy, which I think is is kind of was kind of my main point was. These projects should be treated equally, and our focus should be on the community and the health of the community around them. And gatewaying one project through another from a governance perspective seemed wrong. And maybe I was misreading hearts, but let me let me process. I think not okay. Thing. So then it's, it's good um, you said that because I think you are misreading because I think everybody is basically saying the same thing that they're all equal, great. but that they they sort of agree that there are some things that are dependencies and they agree to sort of take those concerns and so forth under advisement and the TSC, if we feel that there hasn't been enough of that sort of uh, yeah. discussion and, and, and so forth, that 
we can sort of send it back and say, hey, go talk to those guys because you're sort of taking independency or yeah. you're you're building on top and, and you want to make sure you're aligned. So then I think we're all saying like, the same thing. But then, then what the yeah, I, I had um, read uh, Brian's note as, as saying flat, but I think something that's probably started to get lost as the thread continues is some other um, kind of unofficial criteria or hard to quantify criteria about what's what makes what is the the substantive level that makes something be a project right and, there was, yeah there was some of that and then i think there was definitely the marketing thing and i think that you know we need to work with dan and greg and and so forth on the the marketing aspect because i i can certainly appreciate from the hyperledger perspective how do you talk about and reason about these things to an external community that isn't plugged in and and so that i definitely you know agree we need okay. to figure out so okay. I, and just um, the one thing that, sorry, one thing that I was just going to inject in here is that as we change the roles and the relationships between the projects, one thing that has to be clarified is what are the expectations for the TSC. That was my biggest concern coming out of there and going well going into this was that we are expanding the scope of the number of projects, which makes it harder and harder for the TSC to um, uh, evaluate kind of uh, technical contributions that are a part of that. So being clear about what the expectations are for the TSC for understanding also has to be um, exposed in this. Okay, fair enough. Okay. I'll, All I'll right, take let's take it back again. to the list then. And, yeah. yeah. Makes sense. Okay. All right, thanks everyone. And uh, we'll chat at you all next week. Thanks for the good discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Thanks everybody. Thanks. 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 Thanks.